Thanks for your attention. At this conference, we're all aware that uh, we live at the dawn of an age, age of AI computing. Uh, we're also aware that silicon uh, is near the end of a terrific run of improved performance. So there's a bit of a collision between the demands of AI and the capabilities of our computing technology. I'm going to talk about trying to achieve human or even superhuman scale artificial intelligence within the constraints of the technologies that we have or will have in the very near future. I'll start with this quote. This is from a uh, Polish-born English mathematician called Erwin John Good, who in fact was uh, one of the founding fathers of the idea of building artificial intelligence machines. He wrote a seminal paper or two in the 1960s. Uh, and he contended that the survival of man depended on our ability to construct an ultra-intelligent machine. Uh, I think his thinking was that without advice from an intelligence greater than ours, we might ultimately come to harm. Um, and he defined ultra-intelligence as uh, a machine that can far surpass the capabilities, the intellectual activities uh, of any man, however clever. Uh, to some extent, this is the objective of the current work in artificial intelligence. It's not the only objective, so uh, just to remind ourselves, there are two forms of AI computer that might be valuable. Uh, one is a capacity machine, which simply does a task, perhaps a tedious task, that humans would rather not do, uh, more cheaply than humans. So intelligence computing uh, that is cheaper than a human per unit of work. Uh, the other type of machine, uh, and the one that's the subject of this talk, is the capability machine. Uh, and here the objective is to do things that humans cannot do, um, at least in specific domains. There are many areas of human intelligence, such as how to find food, um, how to have relationships with people, uh, which are probably never going to be particularly important for AI. So useful capability AI at least has some advantage in being more specialized than a human. Uh, a capability machine's uh, capability uh, is a function of two things. First of all, how well designed the machine is as a brain. And secondly, how well educated it is. Um, and the brain design we might break down into how data is represented, the effectiveness of data representations that the machine can deal with. Uh, and secondly, the effectiveness of the algorithms that are used for training the machine and doing inference on the trained material. Uh, and then the educational effort is a question of uh, the quality and quantity of training data uh, and of model scale. Uh, and this is a particularly important point. The number of tunable or learnable parameters that the machine has ultimately will determine its intelligence. Uh, or at least this is the state of our understanding today. Bigger models mean more potent AI. I, th I think in this conference we're all aware that this is uh, current thinking. Um, certainly it's the case that the stored information capacity of a model in terms of its number of parameters limits what can be computed uh, given sufficient training and given good enough algorithms, uh, whereas the computation rate of any sort of computer simply determines how quickly the AI can do its job. So in a sense, capacity in bytes is always more important than performance or speed in flops. And I'll come back to this theme a few times during the course of the talk. Um, it's been an observation over the last few years with uh, ever more complex neural networks, for example, that intelligent capabilities do tend to emerge with model scale. Here are some illustrative pictures from a, a recent paper by uh, the Google team, I believe, called Palm, um, illustrating that as you scale from 8 billion parameters to 62 billion parameters to 540 billion parameters, for this particular type of model, uh, new phenomena that we might associate with intelligence are displayed. Uh, one of my favorites is this. Um, this is a machine that has learned how to explain why a joke is funny. Uh, it's not a very good joke, it's a very geeky joke about uh, AI computers. Um, and the explanation is a bit dry. Um, 
Nevertheless, uh, the machine was not taught to have a sense of humor. It naturally developed the ability to understand a joke simply by being exposed to enough data. So this is a, uh, the emergence uh, of a characteristic that we associate with human intelligence, which, is sim which has emerged simply as a result of increasing scale. Uh, and there are, there are many others. So what is the parametric scale of a human uh, in terms of the number of bytes in a human intelligence? Uh, well, uh, we have some reasonable estimates. Uh, we know that human brains have somewhere between 100 trillion and 1,000 trillion trainable synapses, or synaptic weights. Uh, they're probably highly redundant. Uh, we do know that brains can sustain damage and yet still uh, recover. Uh, which does suggest some information redundancy. We also know that for some of the synapses, particularly those in the hippocampus, the resolution of each synaptic weight is somewhere between four and five bits. Um, so we might reasonably say a brain has some hundreds of trillions of bytes of information capacity stored in its parameters. And as far as we know, all of our intelligence, all of our learning, everything we feel, everything we know, is stored in those synaptic parameters. Now, artificial neural nets have some, dis have some advantages <laughs> over biological brains. Uh, the most obvious, of course, uh, well known, is that uh, in an artificial neural network, we can exploit the convolutional property. In other words, we can reuse learned parameters across the structure of the uh, neural network. Uh, and a biological brain doesn't appear to be able to do that. Uh, perhaps equally significant is this business about being able to specialise. Uh, we would be very happy to have superhuman AIs that only were superhuman in a subset of human intelligence activities. Um, so AIs can afford to specialise uh, their intellectual activity more than a human. So we might conclude from this that the parametric scale that we require of a machine that's going to ex exhibit superhuman intelligence or ultra intelligence as Jack Good called it would contain perhaps a hundred trillion bytes of learned state a hundred terabytes that's quite a lot but not a staggering amount uh, certainly you could hold in your hand a hundred terabytes of solid state disk today <clears throat> now the state of AI uh, in 2022 uh, is worth uh, considering for a moment. Uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, a general vector representation of multimodal data. What I mean by that is that we can build neural networks, um, in particular, that can handle speech or text or images or videos or graph relationships. And in each of those cases, the data can be encoded as sets of vectors which make them compatible with the same neural structure. So this is a little bit like the cortex in your brain. It handles various different types of data on a common structure. So that's one interesting characteristic of how far we've got to. Uh, we also know that likewise, uh, like the cortex, uh, we have emergent in the field of neural network design, artificial neural network design, some elements of general model architecture things like multiple layers uh, in which there is a linear process followed by a nonlinear process. Things like uh, residue modification of the vector representations at each layer. Um, thirdly, and perhaps most interestingly, we have a master learning algorithm, <coughs> which is stochastic gradient descent with back propagation. Um, I shall come back to that because that master learning algorithm alone tells you a lot about the computation necessary to build a superhuman machine. Um, and finally, we have reached the point where we have managed to decouple the computational scale of an artificial intelligence from its parametric scale. In other words, rather like the human brain, there is a prospect now in silicon that we can have a vast knowledge capacity without a vast computational cost and therefore a vast uh, power or energy cost. And again, I shall come back to that. First of all, let's remind ourselves that AI computing today is already very complex. 
Um, here is a, a graphical representation of software running on a graph core IPU-based uh, supercomputer. Uh, you may be able to make out very tiny uh, dots in the blow-up. <laughs> Each of those tiny dots is an independent C++ program. And the tiny filaments between the dots uh, represent data moving between those programs. And the state of AI today is such that there are millions to billions of these independent programs uh, active in a single training run of a single neural network model. And, and during that training run, each of those little sub-programs may be executed a million times or more. So this is a vast parallel processing system, uh, even today, and it's nowhere near the scale of a human brain today. The, the story in hardware is similar. Um, we have uh, chips which are as large as we can make. They contain tens of billions of transistors. Uh, and then we combine many of those chips. In this case, uh, you can see the 1U chassis blade there. That contains four of these IPU chips shown on the left, which are the graph core uh, intelligence processor chips. Uh, and then those 1U blades are combined into uh, racks and then multiple racks may be used together. Uh, so in aggregate, we have trillions of transistors being applied to a single program, a single training run in particular, but even for inference sometimes. Um, it may involve tens to even thousands of chips and thousands to millions of watts. Uh, and running a single program, a single training program, may take uh, hours or it may take months of computer time. So the scale of AI is already very complex, very expensive, and it's nowhere near human cognition. You can see where I'm going. First of all, let's have a look into one of these chips. This is our own GraphCore Colossus Mark II intelligence processor. This is the highest performance in terms of peak flops chip available commercially today. Um, there, there are others that uh, uh, are always in the pipe, uh, ready to overtake it. But today, this is the highest performance chip you can buy. 350 teraflops per second uh, in 16-bit floating point uh, arithmetic. It has just under 60 billion active transistors. It's a 7 nanometer device made by TSMC. 14 metals, 86 masks. Uh, it's a full reticle device, 823 square millimeters, which is maximum ret reticle size. Uh, on the chip, we have nearly 1,500 individual high-performance processors, each executing multiple programs on multiple threads. Uh, they each have some uh, memory, and in total on the die, we have nearly a gigabyte of SRAM. So it's actually probably the world's largest SRAM chip as well, if you ignore the processing. It has a central exchange interconnect spine that allows the processors to communicate with each other. And on the chip, that allows 11 terabytes per second of non-blocking tile-to-tile traffic. The whole assembly runs at 1.85 gigahertz. And at this scale, a synchronous system is not really feasible. Uh, it would certainly be very energy expensive. So the clocking is mesochronous. There is roughly a three clock cycle drift from one corner of the processor to another. Uh, and of course, at this scale, uh, without uh, extensive repairability, uh, this machine would, uh, would yield very poorly. Um, this has repairability at the level of the uh, memory macros, the exchange uh, fabric elements, and the processor cores themselves. Um, the processor cores, in fact, one in every 24 processor cores are redundant on this, on this device. Let me go back to that master learning algorithm of AI, which is stochastic gradient descent with back propagation. The algorithm is really very straightforward. <clears throat> the picture here shows data coming in at the top left. Um, the data is transformed into different uh, activations at each of several layers. And that transformation involves the previous activation combining with the stored weights. Uh, at the end of the forward pass process, which is the process left to right along the top, 
a loss is computed and fed back in the opposite direction. And that loss is used to calculate two forms of gradient. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this. Um, first of all, gradients with respect to activations, and secondly, gradients with respect to weights. The gradients with respect to activations allow the next gradient calculation stage to proceed, and the gradients with respect to weights inform the weights of the, a better value. In other words, they act as weight updates to improve the uh, performance of that particular um, sample passing through the machine, or to reduce the loss, if you like. Now, this simple algorithm has some interesting characteristics that dictate certain things about the structure of AI computers. Uh, firstly, um, you can see that there is a big loop from the, along the left to right along the top, the forward pass, uh, through the loss calculation, and then right to left uh, along the bottom, the backward pass, is one continuous loop. And unfortunately, that makes it rather hard to parallelize. You can't simply pipeline a structure like this uh, because of that loop. Uh, it's still possible to pipeline um, SGD, but you have to do it by splitting batches into many pieces. Um, if you like micro-batching, uh, that dictates that you need large batches of data, for example. And the maximum size batches of data you can tolerate, well, that, that depends, or at least has a bearing, on the convergence of the learning. Um, so again, that is limited. So this algorithm makes uh, high performance uh, parallel processing really quite difficult intrinsically. The second thing you can say is that the data flow is really very explicit. Uh, in fact, there's very little argument in favor of automatic caches in an AI computer. That's quite a big statement because I would say, as a processor designer of many years, uh, I would say that 90% of all of the work that's ever gone into processor performance has focused on cache systems and branch prediction. Uh, and yet here we have the data flow laid out to the compiler. So both of those um, hardware features are, are not really very useful. Uh, one of the many ways in which AI processors differ from uh, CPUs, for example. Um, Another characteristic imposed by this master algorithm relates to the memory. Um, so the master algorithm of SGD requires that you do many small adjustments to each of your learned weights, typically a million. And on each adjustment, you read all of the state of the model, both the weights and any optimizer state that helps the weights to converge. You do some calculation, and then you write those, those states back, all of it. Now, if you have 100 trillion weights, you're probably going to need about a petabyte of state to hold the weights and the optimizers together. And the first thing you can say is, well, that will need to be in DRAM. Why can't it be in SSD? Well, because the SSD would wear out. You cannot read and write an SSD, or at least not today's SSDs, uh, a million times. It would wear out in a single program run. So you have to have a petabyte of DRAM. That's quite a statement for an intelligence machine, not least because it would cost you uh, several million dollars just for the memory devices. Uh, but there are also other issues. Uh, you would have a fabulously effective um, alpha particle detector. So you'd ha obviously have to build in um, resilience to, uh, to corruption of that DRAM. The second thing is that if you're going to do a million iterations, and you can do one iteration in a second, then you're going to take 12 days, roughly, to train your machine. That's the fastest you can do a million iterations. Um, that might be OK. Uh, people today do regularly wait a couple of weeks for a big model to train. Perhaps they're prepared to wait a couple of months, but it's of that order. Now, in order to do an iteration in one second, bear in mind that in an iteration, you have to read all the state, do some work, and then write it all again you're going to need two petabytes per second of bandwidth. So in other words, you need not only a vast DRAM memory system, but you need a vast DRAM memory system with a very high bandwidth, a much higher bandwidth than you would get from a petabyte of server class DDR DIMMs in DDR4 or DDR5, for example. So all of these characteristics of AI computers 
fall out of the fact that we have a master learning algorithm for AI. Um, the first decade of improving chips in particular, but computers in general, for AI is almost done. Uh, if we regard the breakout of modern AI to be marked by, for example, the emergence of AlexNet and its ability to famously recognize cats and people, then we're nearly 10 years into AI computing in anger. During that time, uh, GPUs have dominated AI computing. I know that NVIDIA recently, in their recent GTC, claimed that over the last decade, they've improved the performance of GPU AI computing by a factor of a million. Now that is of course a marketing number, but it's worth considering the real number. The real number is about 300x. If you go from Maxwell in 2014 at 6.6 .6 teraflops, which was then of course float 32, to the upcoming Hopper device, which will uh, hopefully be here by the end of the year, which is about 2000 teraflops in 8-bit floating point, then you have about a 300x improvement in GPU peak arithmetic. And as testament to the quality of software engineering involved, the fraction of the peak arithmetic that you can use in a real application has remained roughly constant at uh, around about half. So it's a realistic comparison, 300x. Where has it come from? Well, about half of it, about 16x, has come simply from using smaller floating point numbers um, and in particular in matrix multiplier units, uh, which perhaps to some extent limit the transport required uh, for those numbers. Uh, so that's the biggest component. The second biggest component, about 8x, has come from improving process nodes from 28 nanometers in the Maxwell case to 5 nanometers in the case of Hopper. That's about 8x. And then of the rest, about 1.7x has come from a faster clock from just over one gig to now 1.85 gigs. But that's come at the expense of quite a high power overhead, about 2.8x increase in power. And finally, how much has come from actually tuning the architecture to AI? Bear in mind that GPUs were never designed for AI, they were designed for graphics. Uh, the answer is only 1.4x, a surprisingly small number. But when you think that it's still in the GPU's case, had to hang on to the CUDA software ecosystem, uh, maybe that is a number that, to some extent, has been held back. Where are we going in the second AI decade, uh, on those four aspects, at least? Well, I think the use of ever smaller floating point numbers is probably mostly done. It's possible that we'll be able to find some utility for four-bit numbers, they won't be floating point, but they may be logarithmically distributed four-bit numbers. Uh, but it'll be hard. Even training and in doing inference with eight-bit floating point numbers is non-trivial from an algorithmic complexity point of view. So probably we're done. The biggest single component is, is all used up. Um, the second component, inc improving process technology. Well, I'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, we might get another two to three X, I think, over the next uh, 10 years in improving process technology, not as much as we have historically had. Um, clock speed, well, certainly that we can build things that go faster. Uh, but in order to make them go faster, we will have to spend disproportionately more power. So let's say we may get 2x from that at 3x power cost again. That would be something like a 2 kilowatt chip. So definitely liquid cooled and definitely non-trivial. And then the last one, how much could we get from better architectures tuned to AI? Well, that's, that's an open question at the moment. There are many technology companies, GraphCore included, that are currently um, executing that mission. Certainly there will be more advantage to be had from ground up AI architectures than has been got from uh, moving GPUs uh, towards AI. Uh, but the the bottom line uh, conclusion here is that much of the huge 300x that we've seen in the first AI decade is not going to be similarly available in the second AI decade. In other words, AI processes will get better, 
but they won't get better that quickly. Let's look at uh, dye density, or the transistor density at least, on a single silicon dye. So this is a normalized scale. Uh, it shows from 1995 to uh, roughly now, uh, roughly what is labeled as a three nanometer process node. Um, obviously, that's not a terribly meaningful number. Um, in the first 25 years of th that period, uh, we have saw uh, roughly 2,000x increase in functional density. Um, actually, not, um, not quite uh, the Moore's Law 2x every two years, but close to that. Um, what we're seeing now is that the SRAM density is starting to flatten out. In fact, between uh, 5 nanometers and 3 nanometers, we're not expecting significant increase in the density of a 6T SRAM cell at all. Uh, you can impute this. I'm not sure that uh, 3 nanometer SRAM cell dimensions have been uh, publicly disclosed, but you can impute it from the fact that there have been public claims of a 20% improvement in SRAM macro density. And if you consider that roughly 40% of an SRAM macro scales with the logic, um, the logic scaling has been declared, so you can impute that the 6T SRAM cell has not scaled at all much. Uh, slightly to better picture on the logic, uh, as you can see, there is uh, continuing density scaling there, but the bad news is not for much longer. In other words, what you're seeing here on SRAM is about to happen to the logic as well. Um, all is not lost. There is some new engineering emerging. <laughs> Dye density engineering does continue, but definitely much more slowly than the historic Moore's Law track. Uh, IMAX estimates are here uh, in terms of uh, timeline and effect. Uh, first of all, gate all around and fork sheet transistors. We'll see those in the next few years, but they will have minimal density effect. Um, their density, in fact, will be disguised largely by the tracking density uh, of standard cells. Um, the two things that will have a density effect, uh, in my view, are buried power rails, um, and IMEC, which is an optimistic organization, thinks that they are about four years behind N5. Uh, and then a much more sophisticated technology, vertical stacking of N and P transistors to form so-called complementary FETs. Uh, IMEC think that's 12 years behind N5, so a long way from today. Um, and as I say, IMEC is a historically optimistic organization. So uh, dye density will continue uh, to improve, but not very quickly. Um, what will supplement it or replace it, if you like, and we're seeing more and more of this, uh, you will all be aware, is multi-dye integration uh, onto common substrates, either silicon substrates uh, or packaged substrates. And there are, there are some examples of various companies here um, AMD's MI250X processor showing, for example, uh, silicon bridging between two big GPUs each, um, accompanied by HBM vertical stacks of DRAM. Um, in the middle, on the top, is Intel's very ambitious Ponte Vecchio, 42 separate pieces of silicon on two interposers, plus uh, eight HBM stacks, each nine die deep. Um, top right, uh, interesting, is uh, Apple's use in the M1, uh, not only of a die-to-die -die bridge, but more interestingly, perhaps, uh, the mounting of LPDDR onto substrate, allowing for a much denser uh, DRAM to die um, interconnect. Uh, and we're starting to see more and more use of LPDDR in this uh, modality. Um, Bottom left, AMD's Milan X, the first uh, big example, I think, of chip on wafer uh, vertical integration in which the processor die have little SRAM die providing uh, additional cache mounted on top. So in chip on wafer technology, I'm sure you're aware, first of all, the, a wafer is sawn uh, into chips. The chips are separately tested. And then the good ones are mounted on top of an, uh, the the die sites of an unsawn uh, second wafer uh, of different type or different design. Um, and then that in turn is sawn uh, and those devices tested. O on the bottom right, <laughs> uh, you have the complementary technology, which is wafer on wafer vertical stacking. And, and Graphcore, our company, 
uh, uses this technology to stack a logic chip, an N7 logic chip, our Mark II uh, device that you saw earlier, with a DRAM technology wafer that provides decoupling capacitance. Uh, it, it's not used as a DRAM, but it uses DRAM deep trench capacitors to provide a terrific amount, um, hundreds of microfarads, of deep coupling capacitor within microns of the transistors. And this allows the N7 die to be provided with a super smooth power supply at very low voltage, uh, and thus allows it to operate faster and at uh, a low, lower power. So that's a terrific technology. First use of wafer on wafer uh, in production. Um, and we will see this technology go further. We've, we have already uh, discussed um, in public uh, that, that our plan next is to start stacking logic wafers on top of each other as well to form more powerful um, vertically stacked logic chips in which we can exploit the vertical interconnect um, to carry signals as opposed to simply carry power, which is what's happening here. Uh, and then the one I missed out in the middle uh, center bottom there is uh, Tesla's uh, use of info, integrated fan out technology, a reconstituted wafer of tested chips uh, that has uh, numerous uh, interesting value propositions. It can be metallized like a, a normal wafer, but you can also solder connectors to it. You can solder power um, supply components to it. Uh, info has been around for quite a while uh, in the mobile phone industry in particular but never before, to my knowledge, used at wafer scale. Uh, so all these technologies are super interesting, and they supplement the, uh, the tail off, if you like, in silicon dye density. But they do so, obviously, increasing cost, increasing power, increasing complexity of designs. At this point, let me digress a little bit. I have said that these uh, AI programs running on AI computers today are already very complex hardware software systems, massively parallel, ultra parallel, if you like. And an interesting question arises, well, some interesting questions arise, such as how do you maintain program order between millions of independent programs talking to each other in an efficient manner? How do you contain the communication resources required for all of those sub-programs to talk to each other? Uh, let me show you how we do it on the Graphcore Colossus Mark II IPU chip by showing you the hardware and software abstractions and then our computing model for that chip. The hardware abstraction is as follows. We have many, uh, nearly 1,500, as I said, compute tiles on a chip. The hardware abstraction actually crosses over multiple chips as well, so you may have many thousands of compute tiles in a system. Each tile has a processor, which happens to be multi-threaded, but that's relatively unimportant. And it has some memory. And in fact, the only memory in the processor system, apart from externally attached memory, uh, is in those tiles. So it's a pure distributed memory system. And then the third and final component is what we call the exchange. And this is an, a non-blocking interconnect, stateless interconnect, that allows those tiles to move data between uh, each other. You can consider the data movement as being memory to memory, if you like. Um, the software abstraction uh, is similarly straightforward. Uh, a computing program, uh, AI or otherwise, uh, is represented as a graph to a compiler. Uh, and the graph has two different types of vertex. Uh, there are compute vertices, which are colored pale blue here. And there are uh, tensor vertices. The tensor vertices obviously just hold data. They're just data buckets. They can be all sorts of different shapes and sizes and numbers of dimensions. The compute vertices can do compute. They can also contain state. Uh, you could ask, why don't we just have compute vertices in that case? Uh, the answer is the tensor vertices are designed with the knowledge that they may be spread over many chips, because they may be very large whereas the compute vertices are always of a size that fits on one of those pr elemental processor tiles. In other words, the compiler will always break the compute up into small pieces, but it may not uh, necessarily want to treat the tensors in that way. So that's why we differentiate these two 
uh, types of vertex. And then the constraints on the graph are relatively straightforward. Uh, it is directed. Uh, you can have loops. Um, the graph is bipartite. In other words, the compute vertices can read uh, slices of tensors, uh, and they can write slices of tensors. Um, and each compute vertex, uh, is its functionality is represented by an atomic C++ sub-program that we call a codelet. Uh, by atomic, uh, I mean that the data is available when it starts to run. It will run to completion or error, uh, and no one will use its output data until it has finished running, so it's atomic in that sense. Otherwise, it has all the normal properties of any other C++ program. Uh, and then there are two other components of the program. There is a control program that conditionally executes sets of these compute vertices um, and obviously can do so in response to conditions that uh, emerge in their results. Um, and finally, there is a host program. So an IPU, like a GPU, is always an accelerator to a host processor of some sort, typically a CPU. Um, the host processor in a GPU usually runs the program and delegates arithmetic kernels to the GPU. That's not what happens in an IPU system. In an IPU system, the AI program is actually distributed across the whole machine, across all of the tile processors. And the host program only really has the responsibility for terminating input-output pipes. Uh, nevertheless, that is the software abstraction. It's, it's very straightforward. Um, and so that brings me to how do we keep control of parallelism? Uh, we use a protocol known as bulk synchronous parallel. And in this protocol, uh, we loop around three steps constantly. The three steps are synchronize tiles that wish to communicate with each other, then allow them to exchange data once they have synchronized, and then as soon as they have received the data that they each individually require, allow them to compute on that data. When they've run out of computation that can be done with that data, then the sequence repeats. The graphic at the bottom shows uh, an example. This is actually a BERT uh, training program, BERT large training program. Um, the three colors represent those three different phases. Synchronization in yellow, exchange in blue, compute in pink. Uh, time, or at least uh, processor clock cycles, runs left to right horizontally. Uh, and the tiles are ordered in some sequence vertically. So there are actually 1,472 separate lines on top of each other there. You can get a rough idea by using your built-in optical comparators <laughs> that we spend about 60 to 70% of our time computing, about 20 to 30% of our time exchanging data, and about 10% of our time waiting for synchronization in this system. There's a very simple way of allowing a massively parallel program to execute. It has numerous advantages, but one of them in particular is that you cannot write a program in this protocol that contains a concurrency hazard. So in other words, you can't write a program that has a data race or a live lock or deadlock in it. Uh, and that in itself is hugely valuable if you can prevent the programmer of a machine that can run million-way parallelism from writing a program with that class of bug, <laughs> then you have done computer science a huge service. Um, there are numerous other properties which favor uh, BSP for the AI age of computing, but uh, I don't have time to go into them today. And then finally, uh, just to give you a uh, an idea of how um, how this looks in the silicon. You, you've seen this picture of the uh, IPU processor before with the central exchange stripe. Um, this is the thing that does all the data movement. Um, it's effectively the, the tile data, uh, it's a, suppose a tile uh, somewhere in one of those big tile arrays wishes to communicate data with a, a tile somewhere else. The, the data will travel down the column that the, tile, that the sending tile is in, along the exchange, and then up or down the um, column to its destination. So this is a fishbone layout. And that's interesting also in comparison to many of the other 
uh, new chips that have been invented for massively parallel AI computing. Most of them connect processes together in a mesh using a network on the chip. In other words, you only communicate with your neighbor in a 2D layout. Um, so there isn't a central exchange spine like there is in the IPU. Uh, a mesh is nice. It makes connectivity very straightforward. You only have butting connections. However, from a bandwidth point of view, it's enormously expensive um, because the average distance across a large uh, mesh uh, in terms of number of hops that you need to go from any one tile to any other tile in a all-to-all -all random routing scenario can be quite large. Uh, in fact, for an n by n array, the average number of hops is 2n over 3. Uh, for an array of the size of processors that we have in the Mark II Colossus, we would dissipate about 96% of the total bandwidth passing in and out of the tiles. Uh, we would dissipate that in forwarding traffic on behalf of other tiles if we used a mesh knock. And this is why we use this centralized exchange spine. Now, you could argue, uh, yes, but the centralized exchange spine requires the data to travel further because you always have to go to the spine along it and then back to the destination tile. Um, actually, for all-to-all -all random routing, uh, and for many other patterns, but for that one in particular, the increase in average Manhattan distance with this layout is only about 25%. So the overhead of a fishbone layout is really quite modest, um, and the bandwidth is completely... Uh, efficiently used. In other words, there's no forwarding loss. The exchange spine is collision-free. It's scheduled by the compiler. Um, nobody ever passes data on behalf of anyone else. Let's return to the other important characteristic of uh, silicon with regard to neural network computing, and that is energy. Today's state-of-the-art in terms of the energy per flop, and bear in mind these are usually 16-bit flops, not the 64-bit flops of supercomputers. Um, the state of the art today is about three picojoules per flop for a real AI program running on a real AI machine. So bear in mind this is perhaps with 50% of the peak flops of the machine being used. Uh, and these, this is for dense transformer type neural networks, which are very common on large machines, what you might call infrastructure or warehouse class machines. Uh, a big model today, a billion parameter model, for example, might require 20 billion tokens to train it to convergence. Um, and in terms of computing resources, that's about 250 of today's state-of-the-art chips for one hour. Um, and the, the power dissipation, while it's doing that, is going to be about 100 kilowatts. Now, if we scale this up, by a factor of a thousand to reach a trillion parameters, so still a hundred, uh, hundred x short of human scale, par par parametric scale. Um, if we scale up to a trillion parameters by a factor of a thousand, then unfortunately we also have to, to scale up the tokens by a similar amount, um, and that means that the compute goes up by a factor of a million, uh, at least in a dense transformer. So now suddenly we require twenty-five thousand chips, ten megawatt system for a year. Um, and unfortunately, this, this is why, of course, trillion parameter uh, models are quite evasive. There are one or two cases now of trillion parameter models having been trained, but almost certainly they haven't been trained with enough tokens to justify that scale, because it would have been too expensive to do so. So what can we do about this energy problem? We'll never get to human scale parameterization with that sort of scaling problem. Um, the bad news from the point of view of silicon is it's not coming to the rescue. We passed uh, in 2005 um, the end of Denard scaling. I'm sure many in the room are aware of that. Um, that was roughly at 90 nanometers. Uh, and since that point, the rate at which the energy per operation has fallen with each successive year fell off dramatically from about 66% during the heyday of Denard, Denard scaling to about 18% per year um, since 2005. Uh, the bad news is it's now, we're now in the third era of silicon energy scaling in which the voltage that we need to operate these chips at 
pragmatically for efficiency, economic efficiency, uh, is going to remain roughly constant. And in this third era, I'm afraid the uh, energy per operation moves even more slowly. Perhaps we will see 5% per annum. In other words, we are now almost in an age of constant energy per flop. So we can build machines with ever more flops, but we will have to pay the power cost of that. Let me demonstrate that by showing you the energy consumed by flops in the Colossus Mark II IPU. <clears throat> so this is doing uh, dense convolutions, uh, and we measure dynamic power at the die. Uh, we actually use virus data here, which is worse than real data. Um, real application data typically is a third or a half less energetic, but these numbers are for virus data, worst case data. Um, and this is for a, a 7 nanometer Mark II Colossus die with the wafer on wafer mounted deep trench capacitor decoupling, in other words, the best power environment. You can see that we operate um, in a variety of floating point precisions. But the most common one is the, is the top line of this table uh, in which we have 16-bit floating point multipliers, 32-bit floating point um, accumulations, and every now and then we round that 13-bit uh, result down to 16 again. Uh, and at this level, we dissipate about 1.2 picojoules per flop. So earlier I said the state of the art was 3 picojoules per flop at the system level. That is also true. But right down at the individual chip level, it's about 1.2 picojoules per flop. And you can see from the pie chart, most of those picojoules are actually in the floating point arithmetic data path. Um, this is partly because, of course, Colossus is designed very carefully to minimize the transport and memory energy. Uh, I mentioned the exchange interconnect previously, but the whole idea of a distributed memory machine uh, is intended to minimize transport distance and therefore maximize power efficiency. So in other words, we're doing a reasonably good job on power, and we are roughly at one picojoule per flop, and we're not really going to move from there anytime soon. What are the fundamental limits? Just to remind you, there's an entropic limit, uh, Landauer's entropic limit, the energy required to erase one bit of information. So if you think of a two-input gate with a one uh, single binary output, um, the operation of that gate erases one bit of information. You can't reconstruct the inputs from the output. Uh, the entropic limit of that is about three zettajoules at room temperature. Um, that turns out not to be a practical limit. <laughs> We're about 100,000 times away from that today. But long before we get close to that, we reach the limit of single electron charge. So today, the smallest nets in a chip design might be around about a femtofarad. The chips generally operate about 0.8 volts today, at least in this class of applications. Um, so the number of electrons holding a bit on that net is about 5,000. Um, now, how many electrons do you need as a minimum? Well, they're quite energetic at room temperature, so you're certainly going to need more than one um, to allow for thermal effects. Perhaps if we cool the chips down to near zero Kelvin, we might be able to do computing with a few electrons. But anyway, the, the electron charge is much more fundamental to uh, silicon computing than uh, Landauer. Um, but more pragmatically than that uh, is the graph at the bottom. Um, so FETs, of course, silicon FETs of all constructions, uh, have a threshold voltage. Uh, and the speed, or one over delay, if you like, of a logic gate goes up almost linearly. It's not quite linear, but sort of linearly from that point with increasing supply voltage. Um, but the power uh, obviously goes up as a square. Um, and if you want to exploit speed, then not only have you got the square of the voltage, but you've also got a V minus V zero term that relates to the speed as well. So it's almost a cube. Um, and for this reason, there's a sort of pragmatic um, operating point for silicon logic. And the consensus is now that's about 0.8 volts. And I don't really expect that to move over the coming years. Um, if we go slower, then we will have to use more silicon material. That's expensive um, because the uh, performance will drop off dramatically. Power will drop off, but performance will drop off dramatically as we approach V0, which is a close on 0.4 volts. 
Uh, if we go faster, well, we can do that, but because of that uh, near cubic in power, the power cost will be very high indeed. Uh, and if you look at warehouse scale or infrastructure class computing for AI or any other application, about, of the third, about a third of the system total cost of ownership is power proportional. So you have to, at least from an economic point of view, if not from an environmental point of view, keep an eye on power. So we must do less compute. There is no alternative. Fortunately, brains tell us how to do that. Brains do what's called routing. Um, some of you will be familiar with this uh, in AI. It's a fairly recent breakout phenomenon, the ability to do routed uh, neural networks. The thinking is this. In a dense neural network, every datum interacts with every weight in the network. In other words, every weight during training is responsive to every piece of data the machine ever experiences. So as the machine scales up the amount of data it needs to learn from scales up as well, and the product of those two means that the compute scales up exponentially. But this isn't how brains work. Brains, brains do not fire all of their neurons in response to every stimulus. In fact, they fire a very tiny fraction of their neurons in response to every stimulus. Brains have the ability to route incoming information to parts of the brain where the weights need to be responsive. And we now know, fortunately, we now know how to do this in artificial neural networks as well. And this will save us. This will allow us to build much more complex, much more intelligent machines, but without huge amounts of additional compute. <clears throat> uh, it's kind of intuitively obvious that this must be a characteristic of an intelligent machine because intelligence involves being good at many things, uh, multitasking, if you like, but also multiple domains. For example, if you build a language machine, well, you'd probably want it to be good at all the languages that humans use. Um, the domain of Russian, the domain of French, the domain of English. Um, also, much intelligence relies on the ability to deal with multimodal data, to be able to associate English language with pictures or graph relationships, for example. So it's pretty obvious that a high-powered AI, a highly intelligent AI, must be able to access its knowledge, its stored knowledge, selectively. And that's all that routing is doing. So routing is the third and perhaps the last um, breakthrough phenomenon in the emergence of AI, uh, the recent emergence of AI. The first was the emergence of deep learning, uh, the use of multiple layers of transformation and nonlinearity to get uh, learning machines to do things that we found really surprising, like be able to distinguish people in pictures or understand basic uh, human language. Uh, this allowed neural network models to expand rapidly and they became uh, tens or hundreds of millions of parameters. We thought they were huge. <laughs> uh, it was obvious that if we could make them bigger, they might become more powerful, but we couldn't make them bigger because they required data to be labeled by humans. Their learning was supervised. And that data labeled by humans is very expensive to acquire. So in other words, the, the first stage of human learning, of AI learning, neural network learning, was limited by the cost of data. Now that was defeated by the discovery or the emergence of unsupervised or self-supervised learning algorithms, which are now pervasive. Um, so in this case, we don't need learned data, we just need a lot of data. Um, and so-called foundational models in languages and images have emerged uh, from that, and they are at least a thousand times bigger than those from the first phase. So it's now common, relatively common, to see models of hundreds of billions of parameters. What limits us from going much further than that towards brain scale today has been the cost of compute, because as the parametric scale's gone up, the compute has ha had to go up exponentially because of this dense property. Uh, rooted networks, uh, which also go by various other names, such as sparsely gated mixture of experts or conditional sparsity, uh, uh, there are various namings. Um, these defeat that dense property. They allow training and inference to use a subset of the stored parameters for each datum. <coughs> 
Uh, the hope is, uh, this hasn't fully been realized yet, but the hope is this will allow another 1,000x, maybe more, uh, increase in the parametric scale of the models, and thereby a much more potent AI. Uh, and ultimately, if that's true, then these, this final set of models will be limited just by the cost of memory. And that's really where we want to be. Not limited by the cost of compute, not limited by data, just limited by the cost of memory. Um, and uh, these, these models are emerging today. Um, and these, hopefully, will take us to the scale of 100 trillion parameters, which is brain scale. What would a computer look like at that scale? Well, still pretty big and pretty expensive with today's silicon technology. Um, here's an example. Uh, it's a graph core design, which we call the good computer. Um, we do this in a variety of sizes, but uh, this is a sort of mid-sized one. It's roughly 100 trillion parameters, so brain scale, which is about 200 terabytes of model weights or parameters. Uh, but in order to do uh, optimization for learning, you, you will need more state than that. So this machine has a petabyte of DRAM. The, the petabyte of DRAM can be accessed at greater than two petabytes per second, which means you can do iterations on a one second basis. As I said earlier, that's important because you may need to do a million iterations in order to train a model and you don't really want to wait more than a couple of weeks. Uh, this machine has 2,000 of our next generation IPUs, the Colossus Mark III IPU, uh, and that yields in excess of an exaflop of compute at 16-bit precision. This is real flops, not, not theoretical flops. Um, if you equate that or, or correlate that exaflop rate with the bandwidth of the memory, you need to reuse each fetched parameter about 5,000 times. Um, and that's a perfectly real, realistic number, um, in fact, a very modest number for uh, neural networks at this scale, so that's fine. Uh, and then in terms of sheer scale of the machine, well, it's about a two and a half megawatt uh, machine, cost, will cost about $50 million list. Um, and uh, you could reasonably fit it into 68 data center style racks, uh, and it would cover an area of about 100 square meters. So not cheap at all but feasible. In other words, it is now feasible to build a machine which has a parametric scale of a human. And because such a machine could specialize more than a human, it could potentially allow the emergence of ultra-intelligence. That doesn't make it ultra-intelligence, but at least it will be a tool to allow that to occur. So finally, takeaways uh, from my talk. Uh, first of all, the very important point that silicon is now in a regime more or less of constant energy per operation. If we don't want to pay the power cost, we must do less compute, uh, and th that is possible. Um, AI compute, therefore, is going to be limited by power, uh, and also within the power envelope available, it'll be limited by the amount of memory that you can touch in about a second. Uh, that's certainly true for training if you're going to do a million iterations for as long as SGD remains the master learning algorithm and there's no sign of it uh, of its demise uh, yet. Uh, but also for inferences, in many inference scenarios you may wish to do inference in a second or less. Um, thirdly, superhuman parametric scale is now feasible, uh, remarkably, but very, very expensive, much more expensive in fact than making another human. Uh, so. So we do need to work out exactly why and for what purpose these machines need to exist. Um, and then fourthly, uh, this is all new. The, the master algorithm of AI, but also many of the other characteristics that AI has, have changed the game of computer design. Not only the silicon, but also the systems, the software, everything. There has never been a more compelling reason or opportunity to co-design new machine architectures and new AI algorithms together to deliver a better um, future. Thank you very much for your attention.